Hi, I'm Katie Culver and we're back for another Media Law Chat. I'm here with Nina Brown. So Nina, why don't you introduce yourself to us and tell us what case we're going to be talking about. Well, thanks for having me. I am Nina Brown and I teach Media Law, First Amendment Law at the Newhouse School of Public Communications at Syracuse University. And before that, I practiced law. I'm an attorney and I practiced law for about five years. And before that, I practiced in advertising and PR law. So now my current job is sort of an opportunity for me to bring everything together in one place. Today, wow, we're going to be fantastic. talking. Yeah, thanks. Today, we're going to be talking about Central Hudson, which is a case um, that directly draws on my experience as a practitioner way before law school because it's about commercial speech. All right, well, let's get going. So uh, tell us a little bit about the Central Hudson case and why you picked it as the, as the one you wanted to talk about today. So the regulation of commercial speech in our country has sort of this tortured past. For a lot of years, there was, no, there was thought to be no protection for commercial speech under the First Amendment, and this was, this was just the, the accepted view. And this started to get challenged in um, the late 1960s and the early 1970s, and there was no real, even when sort of the needle went in the way of, all right, well, some commercial speech gets protection, but we can still regulate it because it's not as protected as other types of speech. It was really kind of a mess to understand, well, what regulation is allowed and what regulation is, is not allowed, and how do you make these determinations? And Central Hudson is a case from 1980 where the Supreme Court really, for the first time, really articulated a test to determine what types of commercial speech regulations would be allowed and which would be unconstitutional. Um, and so I really like it because it's, it's a really easy to understand and apply test. I think it makes- Which is so unusual in what we teach, right? <laughs> I know, I know. My students get tired of me introducing yet another test, but when I introduce this test, um, I think it's a really easy and it, it just makes sense which is great to have a standard like this that we can apply. And even though it was 1980, I mean, we're talking about something 40 years ago, it's still applied today and it still uh, makes a lot of sense in its application today. Yeah, I, I do. I do love the simplicity of it. And it's, it's interesting that, you know, one thing that my students sort of bump on all the time is um, like, well, why wouldn't commercial speech have been um, protected. Like, why was that ever even in question? And I go back to, well, remember that Mickle John guy we talk about and political speech and all of that, that it was, it was seen as, that kind of communication was seen as less than. And the test actually still right. treats it that way a little bit, right? It's not, it doesn't right. quite rise to the level of, say, political speech. Um, but, but imagine a world where commercial speech would not be protected at all. The students just kind of go, right. I can't imagine that. Right. Well, I think that framework is a really helpful way for approaching the case because we spend a lot of time in these classes talking about the hierarchy of speech. This idea that political speech is the most important type of speech and, and thus the type of speech that we're going to be most skeptical of regulation. And so, you know, I do this pyramid of the hierarchy of speech and, and political speech is right at the top. And then underneath that, you have speech that's non-political, but it's it's broadly understood to be protected, literature, arts, music, you know, et cetera. And then underneath that you have this, I always label it as like our um, you know, conditional protections for speech. Mm -hmm. So it's there, we have some protection, but some regulation. And where we see this, I mean, certainly we see it in broadcast, right? Broadcast speech is regulated. It's, it's not that it is not permitted, but it's just regulated. And, and we understand that the balance um, exists there, shifts, shifts the balance to be a little bit more um, regulated. Commercial speech is another perfect example of that. It's speech that has some value, but also there are definite harms if it's left entirely unregulated. And the idea that I always introduce is, what if you allowed advertisers to say whatever they wanted about their products? Well, then they'd probably go too far. They, and that, that would cause certain harm upon consumers. So for that reason, we allow the government to bring it back a little bit and to regulate it a little bit. And so you can kind of see, well, political speech, we want the least amount of regulation, least amount of government interference, because it's the most important. And as you kind of go further down on this list, we become a little bit more open. And that idea is actually reflected in the Central Hudson case. The test that emerges reflects the, the difference in value and the difference in treatment between these types of speech. What do you think are some of the more important areas where government does regulate uh, commercial speech? What, as, you know, what do we as consumers benefit from when it comes to regulation? Well, I think the most important thing um, is that 
it is, and this doesn't mean that it is always regulated this way, but that the government is allowed to regulate false and misleading speech without concern of First Amendment, um, you know, that, that are, are going to be First Amendment harms. So mm -hmm. in other words, advertise a stake or the federal government can easily ban any false or deceptive uh, speech from from advertisers and they do all 50 states have some type of deceptive advertising statute and the federal government through the FTC does the same thing so it's already very regulated when it comes to false and deceptive speech of course we could have a whole nother chat about what that means <laughs> and these tests um, which is probably one of the things that my students struggle with when we talk about central Hudson is is keeping those separate Mm -hmm. Keeping, you know, the tests for deception separate from the tests to determine whether regulation of advertising um, is, is constitutional. But so that's one thing. I think that's, you know, the fact that government regulates false and misleading speech. And then the other regulation that is no problem constitutionally is that speech about unlawful activities mm -hmm. can be banned. And again, both of those are contemplated in the, in the Central Hudson test, too, um, because they are seen to not have any value. And the entire rationale for protecting commercial speech is because it has value in that it gives information to consumers. A hundred percent of the rationale for protecting any type of commercial speech is that consumers get a benefit from receiving this information from advertisers. So where that information is false or it's about something that they're not even allowed to do because it's illegal, that, that, that ceases to exist. So there's no problem for the government to regulate it. Yeah, it's been a, it's been an interesting um, couple of years writing hypotheticals or coming up with hypotheticals for class because you know with the um, patchwork of of um, laws on marijuana consumption now yep. across the states, it's a very easy does Central Hudson apply or does it not when right. it's an ad in Illinois where pot is now legal. Um, right. It crosses over into Wisconsin where it's illegal. Do you or do you not? It's kind of it's kind of right. fun to put the students through, <laughs> through those. I, do, I have the same one. So any of my <laughs> students who might watch this video are going to be tipped off to that. Because I think the idea is if Wisconsin wanted to come up with a regulation that mm -hmm. said you cannot advertise here for marijuana because marijuana is illegal here, mm -hmm. that I mean, depending on what, you know how um, narrowly drawn the, the regulation is, I think Wisconsin has a, probably a very good chance of having a constitutional regulation there. Yeah. But it gets tricky when a state like New York allows um, for medical use, mm -hmm. but not recreationally. And then it allows and it specifies advertising for that medical use. You know, New York has laws where it has to be only a black and white sign with no color. And there's, you know, there are other restrictions. <laughs> the pot leaves um, can't be green. <laughs> right, no, black and white, that's it. So it does become really interesting. But again, when the when the courts look and they apply this test, the ultimate goal is to make sure that the, the government is not punishing more speech than it needs to. I mean, it's, it's similar to a lot of speech tests we look at. It really is, are you punishing more speech than you need to? Is there a good tether between the government's interest and this regulation and examining it kind of with all of those things in mind? Yeah, sometimes the regulations just strike me. So, you know, you can kind of see what government is getting at, but, but really what are the means that you're using to get there? Like the 44 right. liquor mart case, right? Like, what really the, the prices, the regulating the prices. Now that was just, I, I'm not sure uh, it just, you know, the idea that you would, that the assumption that consumers would think it was more expensive than it was. So they wouldn't go out and buy that case of beer, but people might think that it's less than it actually is. So they would be more stimulated to go out and buy the, buy the bag of beer or the case of beer. It's just a right. very government getting into these regulations. Sometimes they make perfect sense. Like you can understand why Virginia would not, would try not to allow um, abortion advertising in the state, right. you know, back before Roe versus Wade. But, um, but sometimes now you look at what they try to regulate and it just kind of cracks me up. Like I just, I don't see the logic from point A to point B. What oh, I agree. What people misunderstand most about commercial speech in general or the Central Hudson case particularly? What, could, what do we all get wrong about it? I, you know, I think it's something I actually alluded to in the beginning of our conversation. It's something I see my students struggle with a lot. I don't think practitioners have this issue, but I think students, you know, they're confronted with tests all semester long in this course. And so when we're studying commercial speech and advertising and they the way I tackle it, at least, is to start with Central Hudson. So you have some framework for understanding government uh, government regulation of advertising. But when you start talking about, all right, well, here are some tests 
to determine whether an ad itself is deceptive. I think students tend to confuse Central Hudson with the tests for deceptive advertising. Mm -hmm. um, and it happens every semester in one way or another. The, the, two, the two are very distinct. Mm -hmm. But I think there's still a tendency to, to make, and, and it doesn't work well. On an exam, when I see a student try to apply Central Hudson, it doesn't really make sense. But students do it enough that I think there is just some confusion there about any regulation of advertising. It sort of covers the gambit. Which, which isn't the case. Um, I think the other, I don't know that it's a common misconception, but another misconception that, that I've seen is that Central Hudson Test has four steps, four prongs of the test, and they're not all equal, um, right? Like there, we, we know that it generally comes down to the, the very last, the fourth prong. And, and I think sometimes it's seen, you know, by not just students, but I see it happening with students a lot, that when they go through the test, they are giving, they're, they're sort of trying to make sure that there are different weights applied to each part of the test when really what it's going to come down to, I mean, it's unlikely that a government is going to pass a regulation that has nothing to do with its objective. Right. right? I mean, it's just, it, it, not that it doesn't happen. We see it as pretext, um, but that's often in other areas of the law. We don't see it too much here. It really does, is going to come down to that fourth element, whether the, the restriction is is more extensive than than is reasonably necessary. Right. So I do see that happen a lot. I also my students tend to be pretty aggressive. They're they <laughs> are like authoritarians. They like the rule of law. Once they've got a little power, watch out if you're on the other side. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, you know, I, I have to say that's it, that's really interesting. My class the last few years really has been not at all interested in deregulation at all. <laughs> more <laughs> regulation. <laughs> Um, and where we hit it most is not as so much in commercial speech, but certainly when it comes to um, offensive, hateful speech, yep. that is where they're like, some, we will figure, our generation will figure out the lines that can be drawn. <laughs> the lines yes. will be drawn and we will be the ones to draw them. It's, I see the same thing. Yep, it's very interesting. So, if, you know, given the makeup of today's court or where we are with, you know, current philosophies, do you see any, um, do you see the Central Hudson test in any danger? Or is commercial speech, you know, headed for uh, any less protection? It seems pretty pretty stalwart to me. <laughs> no, I think it's going to go in the other direction. I worry it's going to go in the other direction. So um, the past few years, oh gosh, you asked a question that how much time do we have? Because We've got plenty this, of time. This is, this, is, this is the million dollar question. So the past few years, this court, I think probably beginning around 2010, Citizens United has shown a really strong preference to give corporations First Amendment rights. And in my view, it's very expansive. Um, so we have like a central Hudson, or, sorry, Citizens United ends up being a a pretty significant thumb on the scale in favor of First Amendment rights for corporations. And then right around the same time, about a year later, um, the court heard another commercial speech regulation case um, called Sorrell. And in the Sorrell case, the court, it's, I'd love to say there was some clarity, but what happened, I think, is that the court muddied the water a little bit about the commercial speech regulation and the, and the Central Hudson Doctrine. So in that particular case, the court essentially said, sometimes when commercial speech regulations are targeted at the content of that speech, that's really more content-based, and we need to have some heightened scrutiny, which is completely at odds with Central Hudson and its progeny up to that point. So for 31 years, nothing like that had ever existed. The fact that it was commercial speech meant that it was, of course, you're regulating it based on its content. It's, it's the, that it's promoting a commercial transaction. So, you know, how are you framing it that the speech would be anything other? And on that basis, we have, because it also is only as good as its informational value, we've come up with a test that balances that. Well, in Sorrell, the court, didn't throw out Central Hudson, which is really curious in a second. I'll get to why I think it's really curious. But they sort of, they didn't sort of, they said, well, he, you know, when it seems like this commercial um, regulation is targeted at speech because of the, the type of speech, a heightened scrutiny is going to apply. The court didn't say what that heightened scrutiny would be. Yeah. The court didn't say when this, this would actually happen because it's, to me, at least, it's not really clear that Sorrell is any different from Central Hudson or any of the cases that come in between with the way that the government was targeting speech. Again, it, to me, it seems like it's targeted at commercial speech. Mm -hmm. um, 
But what's really curious about it is that the court then said, well, but even if we go through and apply Central Hudson, it wouldn't pass Central Hudson test. So this regulation is unconstitutional. So then the court engages with Central Hudson. Right. And so following this, I think we don't have clarity. I, a lot what we've seen are that a lot of courts have gone ahead and relied on Central Hudson the way they had been doing before Sorrell. Um, we, there, although what is really interesting right now is there's a bit of a circuit split um, on, on sort of this issue or an ancillary issue that it, it's possible that we could see the Supreme Court um, take a case that sort of decides or fleshes out its Sorrell doctrine, whatever that is, even more. Because now some courts in the alcohol regulation context, mm -hmm. the Eighth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit are at a split in how they kind of are, are, are approaching this post Sorrell. The Supreme Court has now a circuit split. If it wanted to take that issue and address it, it could. Although I, I don't know that it, I don't know that it will. I think it's very pro corporate speech, so it could. And I don't know what the two new justices. Um, I don't know their. I mean, I could guess their positions, yeah. but I don't know where they'd come down on it. Although I do think it's, it could be interesting. So I just, I guess I don't have any predictions, but I think if something happens, it's not going to pull back on um, commercial speech protections for um, corporations. I think if anything, it's going to go the other way, which is really interesting because I don't know how you have a more exacting standard of scrutiny for something that does not get the value in society of political speech. Why would we have this? The, the central Hudson test is really an intermediate scrutiny test. It's really not very different from O'Brien. Yeah. Um, and the only more exacting test we have is strict scrutiny, which we all know we say it's strict in theory and fatal in fact. So exactly. is, is it a free for all for advertising? I don't, I don't think any court would rationally come to that conclusion. So I don't know that it makes sense for the court to take it on, but but if I could make money predicting what the, the court did, that'd be a different story. I, can't, I wouldn't be very successful. Yeah, it really did seem to conflate the idea of commercial speech and non-commercial corporate speech. Right. And, and like, you know, swinging the pendulum toward the latter, almost as like in a defensive posture with Citizens United, which had been so uh, wildly unpopular and, right. you know, people really questioning where the court was coming from. This was kind of a chance to say, well, hey, <laughs> we're, we're going right. to double down on the defense. But I think you're right. It is, it is more than a bit, uh, more than a bit curious. Well, this was absolutely fantastic. Fantastic, Nina. Really Thank great you. conversation. Um, I, 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 we could talk forever about this sort of stuff, but that's what makes us media law geeks. So I really appreciate you taking the time, and, and I know the students will love it. Thank you so much for inviting me. This was really fun. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right. Bye, Katie.